Hello. Hi. Here we, here we all are at GDC 2017. I hope that you're well today, and I hope that you've been learning, expanding, and feeling deeply in your experience at this conference, uh, even more so. I hope all else, above all else, that on this journey this week that you take the advantage of accessing the brilliant minds and hearts that congregate here. Uh, this place, this time that we share, and these people around you are something really special. I'm grateful to have you in my life, and I'm honored that you've chosen to attend this talk. So let's begin. Uh, firstly, uh, now that that's awkward, let's uh, make sure you're in the right room. Uh, here's everything that we'll be discussing today. I'll briefly introduce myself. I'll tell you a little bit about what Tacoma is and uh, why the VO production needed to be so weird. Uh, the majority of our time today, thankfully, will be spent focusing on the pre-production, directorial, and technical techniques de developed specifically for this project and the lessons we learned along the way. Damn, you know, I was really, really uh, trying to get technical techniques out so much that I just flubbed the next, but whatever. <clears throat> and finally, we'll wrap up with my personal favorite, the Ask Me Anything style Q&A. All right, let's do this. That's me. Uh, my name is Michael, and I write and direct video games. I am the casting and voice director of Tacoma. I used to be the dialogue lead at a company called 2K, and then I started a company called the Bright Skull Entertainment Group. I'm originally from New York. I currently live in Los Angeles. In the rare hours when I'm not making games, like most of you, I do other things. So what exactly is Tacoma? And again, why did it need the fancy hoopla? Well, in short, Tacoma is Fulbright's follow-up game to their inaugural divisive smash hit, Gone Home. Uh, it's a narrative exploration game, and it takes place on a lunar transfer station midway between the moon and Earth in the not-too-distant future, 2088. Uh, you arrive at the space station to discover it abandoned and need to figure out what happened to the crew. You do this by uncovering fragments of footage that shows in the environment around you AR security recordings of the, mix, of the missing crew's interactions and, uh, and movements. Uh, you can choose to follow and observe any of the AR ghosts of whichever characters you wish, and at any time, then play, pause, or rewind the footage and explore the playback from other perspectives. Uh, if any of you guys are familiar with uh, the off-Broadway theater experiment that is Sleep No More, uh, Tacoma's gameplay is heavily influenced by it. And if you are not familiar with Sleep No More, I highly encourage you to get your ass on a plane, fly to New York, try and get tickets, wait until you get them. No, you should probably, you know what, buy your tickets online and then just go. Uh, <laughs> this is very much so one of those things that's best, uh, best shown by visualiza visualization as opposed to verbalization. So here's a short clip of Tacoma's gameplay to show you what I'm talking about. I can't believe it. Well, you told me we get renewed. Yeah, but I meant us, us, not the whole crew. I guess there's just something special. Something special about Tacoma Crew 88. Yeah, not just special, it's unprecedented. I looked it up, it's never happened before. Well, everything happens once. I don't know, personally, I'm happy for us. Happy to be stuck up here with these people for another year. Some of them. Some of them aren't as pissy as you. I, what's so bad about these people? Well, they live in a tin can for one thing. I think it's a pretty nice can. Oh, uh, you have a pretty nice can. Oh, yeah? Well, I think you have a pretty nice can. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> so, the name Obsolescence Day. It's more like a joke. <laughs> you could say it's facetious. Kai, you probably think I'm an idiot for never even thinking about why it's called that. Out of curiosity, why did you think it was a I thought maybe it was when some old type of AI had become obsolete. But, well, I guess that doesn't make sense. <laughs> I think you get the idea. Uh, and I also want you to remember that, uh, that scene there where they're baking something, because it's going to be relevant later. Okay. 
<clears throat> so as you can see, the narrative paths often split and rejoin, creating very complex scenes where timing and performance uh, of work are concerned. Combined with the aesthetic choices made for the vocal performance in this game, uh, we knew the traditional solo and even basic fixed mic ensemble recording were just not going to cut it. Uh, so we made the decision very early on to do full cast ensemble sessions, but then also decided to add choreographed full movement performances on top of that, focusing solely on the VO performance and not actually performing any motion capture. Uh, because we are very, very clearly insane people. Um, click. The end result is a technique I've been semi-jokingly referring to as faux cap. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to share with you some of the experiences we had and the lessons that we learned. Uh, usually one of the largest hurdles in ensemble recording is scheduling, which is as mundane as it sounds. Uh, coordinating recording sessions where all the actors, studios, uh, creative stakeholders, and so on are available at the same time is no small task. I did a talk specifically on this at GDC a few years ago, and, uh, at this, and uh, in the same year also at MIGS. Um, so I know it's available on the vault if you really want to dive down that rabbit hole. Um, hope you like Excel. Uh, because pretty much every scene in Tacoma has every actor in it, uh, having disjointed and separate conversations, um, it made it actually really easy to juggle the, the complex, what would have been a complex shot list. Uh, we didn't have to rework the scripts, uh, and all the actors could show up um, at the same time, which made actually scheduling this really the easiest uh, ensemble I've ever done. Uh, we did have one major setback, though. Uh, in order to get the material together for the early press builds, uh, we wound up finalizing the cast a year before the principal recordings. Um, then that year later, when we went back to do the principal records, uh, recordings, one of our core cast members was unavailable and shooting on location on the other side of the country. So we had to make a really hard call, and it's a, it's a call that I don't really take lightly. I hate recasting. I, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. And especially when you're doing an ensemble, because the actors grow attached to each other, and they get attached to each other's characters. So part of the psychology behind Ensemble is the actors look forward to coming back and playing with those same people over and over again. Um, their actual real human being interpersonal dynamics start blending into their characters that they're playing, and it really echoes in the performance quite nicely. However, because of this, uh, because of this recast, we had, uh, we had to bring a new guy in, and man, he did really good. He slotted in very quickly. We were very fortunate with this. Um, and he, he, really built, he really brought something to the character that I hadn't seen before. And it's a very complex character, so it was a, it was a nice addition. Um, that I just, you know, I'd have been remiss if I didn't give you a big old warning uh, when doing ensemble and having large gaps in your, uh, in your production cycle. <clears throat> On the plus side, because of these pre-alpha sessions, we were able to stress test our workflow and the techniques that we'd invented for the project to make sure that they worked. Some of them did, some of them became lessons to be learned, um, and it became really valuable. Uh, so that was cool. I'll show you some of that. Um, script preparation and shot lists, we talked a little bit about before. Uh, this is usually a complex part of, the, of producing ensemble content. Um, this too is covered in the talks I mentioned in the vault, so I'm not going to go too far into it. Uh, and again, for this project, it was dead simple. Um, we actually wound up being able to very neatly package everything into three and a half, and, uh, three and a half hour long sessions. Uh, and then with a, you know, a half hour buffer for everybody getting there and being like, oh, hey, the traffic's terrible. Uh. Um, <laughs> you know, getting to know one another. And so, um, so yeah, we, uh, we actually had the opportunity to do this project end-to-end -end linear, uh, which was amazing. We basically got to do it as a play. And, um, and because of that, we were able to have something that sometimes is really difficult to manage in ensemble work, uh, where you're disjointedly going back and forth between scenes. Uh, we were able to ensure, well, without a shadow of a doubt, that the, uh, that the emotional transitions between the scenes would be consistent which is very nice, I thought, and it worked really well. Um, on to something new, uh, choreography. Uh, so because we're entering, uh, because we were, uh, uh, wanted the talent to be able to move around and interact with each other and, and do things with props, uh, every scene needed to be choreographed. Um, 
<clears throat> so here's some excerpts from my blocking notes. Now, I'm going to bring out the laser pointer because my drawings are shitty. Um, where is it? Pointer options, laser pointer, great. <clears throat> so on these pages, I have blocking notes for every scene. Uh, most of what you're seeing here is set dressing and movement. Uh, the actors are these crudely drawn circles with their character's first initials scratched into the center. Okay. Here is an example of two people starting in a location, crossing the room to meet up with uh, another two people. Um, and here's an example of two people walking back and forth uh, to simulate having a walk and talk in a long hallway scene, which I'll show you the results of that in a second. Um, actually, have any of you guys seen the, uh, the footage from Tacoma, like the 15 minute gameplay or anything? No, not a, okay, cool. It's the, that, that sequence uh, that's choreographed right there is, the, um, is the, uh, the opening shot that you see in the, in the, uh, in the station. Um, <clears throat> I kept the set dressing uh, as minimal as possible, uh, and I wanted to use what we already had in the studio, so we used chairs, which are these uh, insanely weird H-shaped runes that are, that are sort of pushed onto the page with, uh, with, with quite an eloquent hand, I must add. Um, and then music stands are notated by these uh, crudely drawn straight lines. So uh, I also sent this, uh, this little beauty <laughs> to the studio ahead of time for setup. Um, it is, if you can't tell, a room layout drawing that's, um, uh, that is labeled because uh, my drawing is terrible, because uh, my handwriting apparently makes things clearer to no one. Uh, for those of you who can't read my handwriting, which is all of you, uh, this says music stands, this is the director stand, uh, reader stand, talent chairs, and um, chairs, because I, I, I just can't draw a chair, okay? <laughs> Uh, well, we got Ashley Cool to, to draw some chairs. All right. Uh, why aren't we going? There we go. Ah, oh no. Get back. Good. Sorry. Um, so would it have been simpler to record the game by, uh, by bringing everybody in for solo recording sessions? Absolutely. Uh, would it have sounded nearly as good? Hell no. Uh, I've said it before. I'll say it again, and I'll say it on every freaking opportunity I get to say it until it is the norm. Acting is reacting. You can't react to nothing and nobody while you're standing in an isolation booth with an Excel sheet in front of you. Um, I think Matt Mercer said it best when we, were, uh, when we were recording Masquerada. He said, Ensemble is giving us the opportunity and the ability to make adjustments in real time, which is a really good way of looking at it. And from my point of view, it removes, the, uh, it removes the mandate for me to have to have the actors play to the voices in my head and allows them to collaborate with me and build scenes together organically and, you know, actually do the fucking jobs that we were hired to do. So that's always nice. Um, it was decided uh, early on that the creative direction for the game's, uh, for the game's uh, dialogue should be what I've been referring to as sci-fi mumblecore. Uh, the emphasis uh, here is being placed on getting organic realism uh, focused performances as opposed to cinematic realism. Um, a good sound design analog for any of you who may happen to be sound designers would be uh, the, like an explosion sound. Um, audience expectations are big, boomy, oofy, and, and, and utterly ridiculously over the top, but a realistic explosion sound is a big pop. Um, so it's the difference between realism and audience expectation. Uh, so when an actor is stationary, standing in front of a microphone as you would in solo recording or, in, uh, or even in, uh, in large room ensemble, <clears throat> their instinct is to focus more on their own vocal performance, which naturally draws them back into cinematic realism. Um, this is generally the desired result for pretty much every other project on the planet, uh, but not this one. Uh, think about it, really. I mean, in your day-to-day -day life, are you focused on the quality of your voice and emoting effectively as you talk to a friend or coworker or giving a lecture at GDC? Probably not, because you sound ridiculous, though I could probably sound a lot better. I'm really sorry. I, uh, I tried to go to bed at 10 last night. It did not happen. So, so for organic realism, the more distracted the actor is, the better. Movement helps put the actor in the scene and it gives them honest pacing and it also allows them to focus less on their vocal performance. 
So here's some example of performances that without the help of movement in the faux capture methods, uh, it's my opinion we would have never gotten to. Now please note before I show you this, the audio in the videos is from the camera and not from the board, so be gentle. Oh my god, wait, is today obsolescence day? Yeah, but didn't Odin give you a job to do? No. <laughs> a computer playing favorites. Well, one does never cease. Are you okay? Can you feel your feet and hands? Yeah. Oh, my hip just hurts. Oh, Bert? Bert! You enjoy it while you can, Williams. You won't have microgravity on your side forever! Oh! I will dunk on you in any gravity! Jump out of gravity! Dunk! <laughs> but maybe when I stop thinking we should really like the most of it. <laughs> she called me! <laughs> it's like, um, it's our dirty dancing moment. Sorry, I had to leave that, uh, that, 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 that out to get you. So that last shot, by the way, uh, where she jumps into her arms, uh, that is the final screen use take. The audio quality was fucking perfect, which blew me away. And I'll talk a little bit about how we got to that in a moment. Um, in addition to the stage blocking, I also used some basic props to further distract the talent and help them with the scene pacing. Uh, being in a treated recording environment, though, I had to be extremely judicious in which props we could and could not use. Uh, obviously, we want to steer away from anything that uh, generates self-noise, but we also needed to avoid props that would make noise by way of manual manipulation or, or, or brushing against. Um, also, uh, I wanted to give the talent the smallest possible tool set so that they could familiarize themselves with the props quickly and not have to learn new mechanics uh, for, for how to handle things. So I narrowed it down to these. A set of rubber-coated dumbbells, and a couple of packs of broken in bicycle playing cards, of which my house has many. Um, I used the weights to help in scenes where the talent needed to show efforts, or uh, if they were like unpacking supplies, carrying large objects, or catching something. Uh, the cards I used in scenes where the characters were doing detailed tasks, like checking in on lab equipment, or decorating a cake. Um, <laughs> Uh, and what I would do is I'd have them, uh, I had like a, a red deck and a blue deck, and I would have them uh, sort the cards in, uh, in, uh, in suit order, um, in, in, in natural deck suit order, and then also by red and by blue. So it was something that they had to focus on while they were performing, and, and you'll see in a second how cool that sounded. It does, and I have proof. Okay. And action. <laughs> so the clean room? Yeah. It's fucked. But we'll be able to breathe on the drone, so that'll be nice. Oh, come on, lift! I thought maybe it was when some old type of AI had become obsolete, but I guess that doesn't make sense. <laughs> yes. Uh, no, AI um, aren't like designer hardware. As soon as the new model's out, you trade in the old one for customer loyalty. AI are more like... Um, but they're more like mighty redwoods, ancient organisms growing and adapting year after year, decade after decade. Right. Um, how do you think this looks? Yeah. Uh, that man, uh, both of those guys, uh, all, all the actors uh, that you just saw are really, really talented people. TJ Ramini is charming as fuck in real life. <clears throat> all right. Another little trick I used concerns the seventh member of the, of the crew, Odin, the ship's AI. Uh, he's a sort of ubiquitous seventh crew member that can, uh, that can be in multiple locations and uh, engage in multiple dialogues uh, simultaneously. It's very similar to the AI OS structure in the movie Her. Has everybody seen Her? Yes. Okay. I wanted the performance between the human crew members to feel so subtly natural and organic but I wanted to have a psychoacoustic cue that was different when they were, uh, when they were interacting with Odin. So we did something a little different there. Uh, 
to get to there, I, uh, I had Odin record outside of the ensemble in a traditional solo isolated recording session. Uh, we also did this with the, uh, with the protagonist, who is not a crew member. Um, she's actually sitting right there. Um, Sarah Grayson, everyone. Um, and uh, we did that uh, so that they would have a disconnected feel from the rest of the organic performances that were going on around them. It came out really cool. Um, and, uh, and what we did in the ensemble sessions, though, was I had my production assistant stand in as a reader face-to-face uh, -face with uh, whoever was talking to Odin at the time. That was uh, the two little crudely drawn sticks. Uh, they were on the other side of those whenever they were talking to Odin. All right. Um, so let's get into some technical stuff. Uh, script preparation. Uh, something we do on every project is to take the script as it's delivered to us and reformat it into our uh, game script template, uh, which is basically the standard theatrical format with a few minor modifications like uh, scene numbers, individual line numbers, and um, if the game has it, uh, file names. If it doesn't, then we just leave that blank. <clears throat> Uh, usually, by the way, when we do file names, we do them in microtext on the far right margin in case you're really nerdy about script formatting and really want to know that one. Uh, but the reason we do the, the, uh, the line numbering, though, it allows me to quickly tell the talent which sections of the script we'll be working on for each take. I'll call things and say, like, all right, let's take, uh, let's take one and two, and we'll grab those two takes back to back. And then I'll say, all right, let's move on, and we'll do three on down to 12. Or, you know, uh, in this case, I'd say three to end of page. Uh, and it allows us to quickly communicate what chunks of script we want to be working on at any given moment. It also allows me to, after we're doing the ensemble takes, if there's something that I feel that we didn't get there on, a line that we didn't, didn't quite get to and needs a, it needs a safety pickup, go back and give me four and give them the lead in on three. So give me three and four. Um, it's, it's just a quick, quick way of communicating. It takes like 30 seconds to do it or that's how much I assume that my assistants take to do this. <laughs> it's probably a lot longer. Um, it's also uh, very important and silly for me to have to say this, but numbering your pages. Uh, when you're using paper scripts, uh, it gets really messy in the studio, and you will totally kill valuable actor and studio time having your actors or an assistant or an engineer or you digging around on the ground looking for page six when you're on page 200. Um, not fun. Well, I mean, you can easily do it if it's numbered six, but if it has no page numbers on it, you're fucked. Um, <clears throat> it's, also really, uh, it's also really useful when you're using tablets, which we pretty much exclusively do now. Um, this motion happens all the time. And then, oh, fuck, where am I? Everybody else is on page 20? 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. 20. If they have the page number, they can see that it's page 20. If you forget to put the, I've, I'm telling you this because when I first started out, nobody was numbering pages. I'm hoping by now this is standard. I'm sorry, this is really boring stuff. Here. <laughs> um, I love actors with all my heart, truly. Uh, but for the most part, actors, they don't really have a lot of knowledge about audio and what microphones pick up and what it sounds like at the end and how it gets from their mouths to the in game. Um, I mean, it's not that they don't have the vaguest of ideas. I'm talking about really technical stuff like shirt motion or things like that. Um, but it, mostly I'm talking about paper. So that's why we use tablets. Uh, man, there's been so many times when we were when you were using paper that the actor would be performing, they'd be in the middle of the most beautiful take you've ever seen, little golden BAFTA trophies were just smiling in your eyes, and then can't use that take. One of the biggest lessons from our pilot session was that paper scripts absolutely need to be eliminated when you're doing any sort of movement in the studio for the same reason. <clears throat> for the same reason. Um, so tablets for everyone. You get a tablet, you get a tablet, you get a tablet. And for you get a meme for anyone who didn't get that joke. <laughs> All right. Uh, when working with FOCAP Ensemble or any Ensemble project, really, uh, pre-populating your markers in Pro Tools is practically essential. Uh, so, and, the, and the same with providing shot lists for the engineers to work off of and for, the talent, for you when you're at your director post uh, to understand how much time you've used versus where you should be in your estimates. <clears throat> Here's a sample of the shot list uh, and then following that, the template that I sent over for the engineering team a few days before the session. Here's the shot list. 
you want to effectively manage your sessions, not waste money, and make your engineers happy, you need to be really fucking organized. Uh, this shot list uh, shows the engineer on the, a, on the B column uh, every name of every scene that we're doing in the order that we're doing it. This one was easy because it was linear. Uh, column C is showing the estimated time for how long each, each, each shot should take to record. And then, uh, and then the, uh, the other columns are all a list of who is on mic and should be re being recorded at any given time. Um, that's a really, 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 I can't make it any smoother than that. Then on the Pro Tools sides of things, um, I had I had I, uh, had, uh, I, had, uh, I had this made. It's uh, one track per actor character. Uh, the, the track names are pre-populated with the file naming convention that I've been using forever. It's year underscore month day underscore actor name underscore character name. That way, when your files come out, and if you've ever seen me talk about my uh, my post-production process. Uh, when your files come out, they're all auto-numbered. Auto Pro Tools is one of the only DAWs that'll do uh, underscore 01, which is one of the under uh, reasons that, that, that I use this. Sorry. <clears throat> it's one of the only reasons that I use Pro Tools. Every other system uses the operating system's file naming uh, convention in order to name its files. So your, so your first take will always be named file name. Your second take will then, in Windows, be named file name parentheses one end parentheses dot wave. File three will be n parentheses or parentheses two n parentheses. The reason that I use Pro Tools isn't because I think it's a great DAW, because file number one is named underscore o one, so that when I'm tracking all when I, either I or somebody else is tracking all of this stuff in an Excel sheet, and they're saying, okay, that was take one a was the select. We have a tool that parses that Excel file at the end of the day goes through and auto renames all the file names with zero margin of human error into the into the depot. So that saves a shitload of time. All right. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, markers are then pre-populated horizontally across the timeline. Uh, what I do is, is I use the estimated time uh, that I have in the shot list and then I add a healthy five minutes to each between each marker. So if a scene took 10 minutes, there's 15 minutes worth of timeline to work with the, there. It, uh, it makes post-production so much faster because when you file, fire up your sessions later, all the scenes are there, all of the actors' uh, takes are there, and you can just quickly identify where you need to be. And there's a lot of separation, so it's not all clumped together. <clears throat> so rounding things out, we did some serious homework on mic selection. Uh, I needed to have something that would work for full motion and, uh, and not have any proximity alteration, you know, getting too close to the microphone or getting too far away from the microphone. Too far away from, I get too far away from the microphone. Um, uh, any movement noise, uh, self-generated uh, noise, and uh, what happens with lavaliers a lot too because it's really thin cable with really shitty shielding is, uh, is uh, self-noise made from conductance. Um, so that you hear like a like a movement noise when the cable is moving around on you. So we tested a ton of mics. Um, I also, if we were using lavaliers, wanted all of the warmth and fullness that can really, I thought, to this moment, only be provided by a large diaphragm mic, uh, because you know I'm I'm really easy like that. Um, so after numerous shootouts with a cater of really disappointing lavalier solutions, we found a clear winner in the DPA 4061. Oh man, that mic sounded so good. I'll play you some stuff in, in, a, in a few seconds. Um, after some experimentation with, uh, with several mic placements, which is very important in lavaliers, um, which included uh, the, uh, the, the headgear with the uh, head-facing microphone placement, uh, which we found to be much too prone to plosiveness. Um, and then uh, also hairline mounting, so over the ear with uh, like a little countryman B3 style kind of thing. Um, and you see that all the time in, uh, in stage and on, uh, on like pop singers and stuff like that. <clears throat> we found that that was too prone to, uh, to cross nose air movement problems, um, which your nose is it's basically a fucking like little baffle, yeah. <laughs> So uh, we, we ended up wig miking. Uh, so center forehead, this got rid of all plosives. It sounds super clean. It also makes everyone look ridiculous, which is great. <laughs> um, by play, and, uh, that's poor, poor, poor Natasha. <laughs> all right, uh, by placing it here, uh, we removed all of those, all of those things. Um, so if you're gonna use a lavalier, 
that's where I would put it. Uh, if you don't believe me, which I wouldn't either, here's some raw, completely unaltered audio from those sessions. I think. I, 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 oh, it's still on the laser pointer. <sighs> That's the pen. No, sorry, sorry. I'm not going to sing for you while we're waiting. There we go. Oh my god. Wait. Is today obsolescence day? Yeah. But didn't Odin give you a job to do? No. Huh. <laughs> a computer playing favorites. Will wonders never cease? Yeah, that was that little walk and talk from before. And again, we have, there's zero editing on this. I just pulled these straight out of Pro Tools. So the clean room? Yeah, it's fucked. But we'll be able to breathe on the drone, so that'll be nice. Oh, come on, lift. That was the, the little wait scene that you saw earlier. And then I'm telling you, this, was, this is completely raw. This is the jump scene. Then I start thinking we should really make the most of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking clean as a whistle. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I, uh, when that happened, I was just like, oh, yeah, we're not going to be able to use that take. And the engineer's in my can's like, uh, yeah, no, that was clean. I stopped the session. <laughs> I went into the, I went, sorry, I stopped the session, I went into the control room and I, uh, and I said, play it back, and I, I heard that and I went. <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's DPA 4061s, I, I, I really like them. All right, um, so here's an area where you really don't want to scrimp. Uh, you do not want to try and save yourself a few dollars by getting four sets of labs for six actors and have them like switch out in between scenes and then start dividing your shot list so you only have four on mic while, while you could be using six. Um, the logic there being that you're gonna save a few dollars renting or purchasing microphones, but your talent is the most expensive commodity in that studio when you're doing ensemble. You will absolutely come out cost negative if you factor in the time suck that is swapping out between takes. So one mic per actor, belt clipped with an XLR. Um, the engineer would come in in between each shot. He would unclip and he would recoil all six mics and then start addressing everybody else. Um, additionally, when I wrote out that stage blocking, I was really conscious and made pre-visualization uh, like drawings, which I then erased, because they were even shittier, uh, to visualize the cable pathways uh, when, uh, when blocking out those scenes, so that I would make sure the actors didn't cross paths or do anything stupid, like wrap themselves around a chair. Um, I mean, who knows what, right? Uh, that's, um, that's pretty much it for the technical stuff which really kind of rounds us out. And that's it. So thank you all so much for coming. Please stick around for Q&A, which is, again, like I said, my favorite. And I hope you guys have questions, because this is really weird shit. Um, there's mics in the aisle. So if you have questions, please line up now and use them. Uh, also, as you leave, please thank the CAs and the AV team for doing such a great job at this show. Without them, this entire conference would be an unmitigated disaster. So please also remember to... F oh. Thank you. And uh, please also remember to fill out your surveys, especially if you really like the session. Um, and uh, my review of you today, I just really enjoyed having you here. So, without further ado, Q and A. You were here first, I believe. Fight it out. Okay, I win. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, really insightful talk. Really awesome. Thank you. Um, on your shot list, you had time budgeted for each of your shots in the scenes that you were recording. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever go over time for any of those shots? And if so, like, how, do, how was the best way to deal with that? Uh, Thank you. That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, so what I do is, is I buffer in a little bit of time for each shot. Um, I also know that the earlier shots in the day are going to take longer than the later shots in the day because, like I said, that's everybody's getting there, especially if it's the first day. You've got to buffer in like a half an hour or so, maybe even an hour. I don't even call that buffer. I actually just call that getting to know each other and try and do like an hour of dedicated just 
hey, let's meet each other and figure each other. Oh, you were in that? I, was, I know so-and-so from that, like all that kind of crap. So you need to put that in. Once everybody gets to starting to work, yeah, you need to make sure that you're going at a pretty good clip and making sure that you're staying on schedule, but you also need to have the foresight to know that you're gonna need a little bit of buffer. Um, also on multi-day shoots, uh, if, you go, if, you, if you do hit a little bit under, it's okay because you have, uh, you, you have thankfully left space on each of your sheets because you're scheduling these, at, that's why I schedule them at three, a, three and a half hours and not like max to four. Cool. It's also, um, when you're doing, if you're doing it like we did, you also need to factor in time for getting everybody mic'd up, wig taping, uh, wig untaping, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Hey, no worries. Hi. This was great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Um, so what I was really struck by was even your use of the word ensemble, because especially talking to voiceover actors, often they never meet each other and they have the other human in their ear. So like, what is the moment that they all went and had pizza together and became an ensemble? Like, what is that? That's a really, really good question. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell an anecdote and then, I'll, and then I'll answer the question, the specific question. Is that okay? Yeah. So we were working on um, another project. We were working on Masquerada Songs and Shadows, which was a 1,200-page, 60-person cast, full ensemble that we did end-to-end -end ensemble. Um, it's great, and if you haven't played it, which I know most of you haven't, it, you should. Um, story is brilliant. But I remember there was a really, really, really seasoned, high-profile voice actor, um, and I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't do the name thing. Uh, he came in to our studio and was just like, he walked in to the room and was just like, oh, you guys are recording? I'll, I can go wait out in the, I can go wait out in the thing. It's just like, no, dude, we need to get you, we need to get you in here. We're, we're you know, performing ensemble, which his agent should have told him, by the way, because we told her, so that's a whole nother mess. Um, and, he, and he just fucking froze and was just like, I could see the shock on his face and the happiness that was exuding off of him moments later. And this is a guy who's done hundreds and hundreds of games and animated films, and he's like a major commercial voice that you hear all the fucking time. And he said, I've never gotten to do this. Hmm. And he gets in the booth and it's like, it's just fucking, it was just incredible to see him be overjoyed. I mean, his character needed to be mean, but to see him be overjoyed <laughs> with the idea and concept of being able to play off each other. And I think that's when Matt said that quote from earlier that, you know, like you're able to make those adjustments in real time, uh, which you cannot do in solo recording. So uh, the specific question that you asked, though, is what was the moment where they all like pizzaed up and got to know each other? Yes. And like, how do you convince people to pay for that extra time to have everyone in the room? Ah, that's a great question. Um, if someone is hiring me to do ensemble, they've got a pretty good idea of what I'm gonna bring to the table, and they usually trust my methods. Um, if it was, when it was earlier on in my career, and I was just starting to try this kind of stuff, it was, it was a little bit of a challenge. So what we did was we called it a table read. And we had everybody come in for the table read. And yes, they familiarized themselves with the material. Yes, they got to know one another. We also, because we labeled it as a table read, brought in all the writers. We brought in the, uh, we brought in the creative director. And we brought in the, uh, the, the, the uh, audio producer and the, and the executive producer. And we all sat down with the actors and I had the writers, I had each one talk about what their contributions were to the project, and I had the creative director talk a little bit about the high end, con the high level concept of the game, and uh, we gave, like, people had their character sides ahead of time, so they were able to ask intelligent questions about their characters. I made sure that the writers were explaining the dynamics and relationships between each character in that room. So this is how you feel about them, this is how you feel about them. Usually what I do when I'm writing is I make a, a character relationship matrix for every single character in that game. Even if they don't know them, I will want to know how they, feel, how they would feel if they had met that character. Um, and then I, I, I usually end up doing that just naturally when I have a script handed to me that I'm trying to think about the dynamic relationship between each character. So does, does, that, does that help you? That was great. I want to see that matrix. You should share it online. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay. Hello. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank yeah. You for coming. Uh, I had a question about um, assuming that you knew that you were going to be doing this sort of more um, experimental method for the actual sessions. Did that uh, in any way influence the means by which you auditioned actors and made your casting decisions? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, we did actually uh, have the agents, uh, we highly encouraged them to submit their theatrical resumes, which you sometimes can't just pull up. Mm -hmm. So we had them submit their theatrical resumes and any, uh, any, any uh, footage that they may have had that highlighted uh, movement. So whether, whether it be like a walk-on role or a recording of a stage performance, things like that. Um, the reason that you don't recognize a lot of the people in that room is because most of them came from TV and film. So that was something else that we, that we ended up doing on this. I mean, a few of them, like, like Abigail Marlowe and Natasha Loring are like killing it in voiceover right now. But the others are like, so, so, the others are, are, are film and TV people. One of them freaking wrote the damn, damn Cosby theme song and was on like one of my favorite shows of all time. So that was cool. Um, yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, however, because we were centered on vocal performance, we really, really, we really leaned into who was going to provide the best characterization of the voice, because movement is, is natural, and we didn't need like, okay, so T-pose, and then freaking go into your thing, and hey, I am angry and Russian, or whatever, you know, like, oh, that's a whole nother thing. Uh, localized movement should absolutely be a thing. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, uh, thank you. That was very insightful. Thank you for the question. Hello. Hi, Michael. Thanks for your talk. Um, I'm wondering, you said earlier that uh, it would have been easier had you done non-ensemble recordings for, the, for this game, mm -hmm. um, but it wouldn't have been as, as good. Uh, if you had to estimate how much more time it took to do the ensemble re recording, like percentage-wise, uh, could you? Is it like 20%, 30%? I will give you a really, uh, a really good answer to that, I hope. Um, so with ensemble, by its very nature, more of your time is spent in pre-production and post-production, but less of your time is spent in the studio. And in fact, most of the time, and I can't guarantee this for anybody out there who's like, we're going to do ensemble and it's going to be great, and then Michael Surick said this, and we're taking that to our producers, but most of the time is, and that's how you all sound in my head, by the way, um, <laughs> most of the time uh, it ends up being cost neutral. And I know that that sounds insane, but uh, it is. That's 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 it's it's just it ends up being cost neutral. That's a good argument. Thank you. Thanks. Cool. Yes. Hi, Michael. Thank you very much. It was terrific. Cool. Um, my question is: Were there any unforeseen challenges that came in on the post side of things from doing the ensemble sessions? Like, I guess if you had a performance from one actor that, that really worked well for the take, um, but maybe not from the second actor or third in the scene. Did, did that make editing those lines more difficult once you got into post-production? Would you mind repeating your question and possibly rephrasing it? Sure. Um, because you had multiple actors in the scene, w I guess within the recording, um, did that make editing those lines more difficult? once you did post-production. Got it, thank you. Cool. Um, so I think what you're talking about is, uh, is step over lines. So yeah, so to, like, like just there. Um, so, uh, and I'm sorry that I didn't go into too much detail on things like that. I've just, I've given a lot of talks about Ensemble at GDC, so I was hoping that we would highlight just the stuff that's specific to the Tacoma Project. But I've covered that before and it's an excellent question. Um, what I do is I have them perform the scene as best as possible, get the scene to sound amazing. And if there's a line that's a step over line, now that they've already got it in their system and know what it is, I tell them to do the scene again, but give me pause for, uh, pause for the ellipses. Okay. And, it's, uh, and, it, and it works really well. Um, there was, uh, this game had very little, uh, very little step over. Uh, it worked out really well. Um, but uh, for things like combat and, and that too, like uh, when, uh, you know, that, that, was a, that was a good example of how I, you saw I had a, like a three burst pain reaction in there. Yeah. That was because in the scene, she's pain reacting while other people are talking. So you do that one time because you don't want to stress the actor's voice. Um, you want to let, let them do that one time so they get the, 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 so that they get the amplitude of the scene uh, to the place where you want it. 
and then you go back and have them do the scene without, uh, without onomatopoeia or any sort of stressful voice work and save that for, for the end of the scene. Does that, does that help you? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Cool. Does anybody else have questions? I mean, you can literally ask me anything. You want to know how magic works or like... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, how are you? Hey, great. How are you? I'm well, thanks. Awesome. Thank you for the talk. It was really great. Thank um, you. Thank you for coming. Well, yeah. So um, the arm jumping take, if the one you thought wouldn't work, what, what an alternative way would be that you would have recorded that? That's, that's a really good question. The reason that we did the arm jump was because we had done like three or four takes of that scene that just weren't getting there with the uh, with that joyous like exuberant movement based performance and so uh, cuz we had them standing still and just being like like jumping for joy or just like just moving or hugging like uh, like air hugging each other and just wasn't getting there and I'll be honest with you like um as a voiceover director working with voice actors, sometimes it's really challenging to do things like ask an actor to do something physical to interact with each other. Um, you don't want to make anybody uncomfortable or to put them outside of their, uh, outside of their, 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 their sphere of, of comfort um, and damage the relationship between you and the talent and also between the talent and the other actor. They're not fucking toys, they're people. So you can do things like ask them like, I want to try something that might be a little bit weird. It's okay to say no. Would you mind actually jumping? But in this case, um, in this case, uh, the two actresses that were uh, that were playing the couple uh, really, really, really like liked each other, like right off the bat, like in reality. And Natasha is just a very like very much so her character. Like they're both very much so their characters. Um, and so Natasha is just like, would it be okay if I just actually jump on her? And Abigail's like, and she looks at Abigail, and Abigail's like, yeah, which is why, <laughs> which is, which is why when Natasha comes off of that, she's just like, she caught me, I can't believe it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it, that ended up just being really cool. So I wanted them to do that uh, just the one time, uh, if, if like, because I didn't think that the audio quality was going to be very good. But to get that amplitude of a motive, a uh, motive response into the scene work, and be like, oh, that's how far we need to bring it. That's that's why that's why that scene worked out really well. There was a couple of other points in the production as well where that happened. There's a um, without getting out. I, I, I did this to be as spoiler free as possible, uh, uh, by the way. Um, but there is there's a there's a scene where the scene just played better, um, where one person had their head in another person's lap, and it worked out really well. And again, I, I, I asked permission, said like, hey, would it be cool if we tried this? And they were just like, fuck yeah, let's do it. I was like, all right, great. <laughs> so yeah. Um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, well, um, another part would be if that didn't work out, how would have you adjust, what would an alternative thing be? I mean, you got the, like, the weight and they know how it would feel, but if the audio didn't come? Uh, if, it, if it hadn't have worked out, I guess. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, I don't want to like, uh, at, the risk of, uh, at the risk of sounding brash or, uh, or, 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 or arrogant, um, I think I'm a pretty okay director. Uh, and I like to think that I'm able to coach people into, th into difficult situations if need be. Again, this one worked out, but I see your point. Like, what if she jumped and she was just still emoting, just like, yay. Mm -hmm. That wasn't how she was doing it, by the way. <laughs> but, um, but if she had been, uh, it's one of those things where there's a few, few subtle triggers that you can do to help to coach that performance without being obnoxious. Uh, one of them is to, uh, do you, have you voice acted before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, uh, who, who is someone who has not voice acted before? Who is someone who has not voice acted before that would be totally cool with standing in front of a microphone, well, standing two feet away from a microphone and giving, you, you? I would. Okay, we'll, we'll do, uh, we'll do, we'll do, uh, we'll do both of you. Uh, why don't you come on up? <clears throat> and while they're coming up, I've... I don't, I, I'm not very good at miming, I'm sorry. Oh, five minutes, thank you. Okay, Okay. Um, so you're in a fight. Uh, you are going to be punching him, and it's going to be a one-hit punch. Uh -huh. So, and remember, I already have previous knowledge that neither of these guys are professional voice actors. <laughs> um, so I want you to do a one-hit punch to him, and it's gonna be a quick, uh, quick burst of kind of thing. So you're gonna be like, Bruh! 
and uh, when he hits you, your reaction is gonna be like, Ugh! wait, no, face, sorry. Ugh! Ugh! There, that. You're gonna, you're gonna go <laughs> and break a little bit. Is that okay? Don't actually. <laughs> okay, so how hard is he gonna hit me? He's not actually gonna hit <laughs> you. Is it more about the speech or the reaction? It's much more about the reaction, and uh, the way that I like to describe combat, which I'm totally stealing from D.B. Cooper, is this. Um, when you're hit, it's always a surprise. So you're caught off guard, and things are very valve driven. Oh, uh, ah, they're diaphragmatic, but in the face especially, your mouth is caught open. Uh, if you are doing the punching, the combat comes from a place of knowledge. You know that you're going to give a punch, so you're secure. Your jaw might be a little bit tighter, so things can be a little bit more consonant driven. Okay, so I want you to punch him. Not really. Go ahead. Okay, that's my. This is my reach. Don't you actually punch him. No, I, I, don't, <laughs> board, I don't actually. I don't want to be that guy. Okay, <laughs> and here we go. Ha! That was pretty good. Can you give me one more take? And instead of coming from the come from the belly, come from the chest. Really get it. Really get your face set. Okay. That was really good. Uh, do me a favor this time. I want you to uh, to to stay on mic. And I want you to uh, I want you to stay on mic. And I want you to uh, to to keep your hand like this on your face. Good. Sharper. Faster. Again. Oh, bigger! Oh, that's the take. <laughs> Coaching people into doing combat rapidly like that really, really helps set the tone for the urgency of the scene. You're faking them into being in a dangerous environment. Pastor, oh my God, I have to. You're in a panic state when you get them to do things really fast. So that that helps great. And thank you guys both for helping. <laughs> I also pretty much always put uh, audience participation in my talks that I hadn't planned to this year, so I'm just so happy that happened. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, first of all, awesome talk and awesome um, audience participation. Great job, y'all. Thank you for um, being here. I, I got to play uh, the demo down at Day of the Devs, which is really cool. I was really curious about how you got the zero-G scenes to work. The what now? The zero-gravity scenes where they're like in the Tacoma Dome. Oh, uh, oh! As far as the uh, as far as the the, vo the, the voice stuff was yeah, concerned, yeah, and like the f like we played we played a little bit of it before. I don't know uh, if you saw, but I when uh, this stuff out, yeah. Oh, okay. So we played a little bit about that before. So what we did was we had them um, like just trash talking each other. Uh, you know, here I'll just go back to the slide because it's fun. Um, boop boop do, and then I think that uh, why don't I answer your, your question while I'm getting the scene queued up? Just a quick question, how much rewriting was there during the sessions? I know with this much, type of game, it can be pretty heavily structured, but was there a time when the ensemble was like, what if, or uh, no rewriting? Wait, one more time, what was that? Was there any rewriting during the ensemble work? No. Zero. Writing during? Rewrites, or changes. Rewrites, yeah, there were minor tweaks, but I mean, it wasn't like, it wasn't like, uh, like, like how Amy, uh, you're talking about the way that Amy Henning does her stuff. Um, uh, the Steve is the writer on this. Uh, they're a little bit different. Uh, he and Carla work uh, very creatively together uh, outside of the studio, um, and they work together. They work great together inside the studio too. But they're just very, very rigorous in making sure that everything is like uh, scratch recorded and play tested a million times before they bring it to the studio. I want to point out this game. We had a very limited budget for uh, for the audio recordings, so the, everything that they could do to prepare properly, they did. And we had we had been working together for a very long time on other projects, so it was just a, a, a very natural, like, hey, this is what we're, what we're doing, can we do this? And I was like, yes, we'll make that work. Um, so, you know what, uh, see me after class and I'll play you that video, unless everybody really wants to see Jupiter Gravity Dunk. Yeah. <laughs> All right, fine. Do I have time to fire up Jupiter Gravity Dunk? All right, cool. <laughs> yeah. All right, uh, do you wanna keep your ink in? No, get rid of that stuff. All right, um, do, 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 do. and then uh, after, yeah. So after this, I'll be in the hallway and you guys can, can all find me there. I'm around all week. Um, this conference is about meeting people, it's about building connections, it's about, it's about having friendships. Please, please, please don't be frightened to talk to a person. Just remember that they're a person and be kind. Um, I encourage you, if you wanna to talk to me, please just do so. I was, I was really scared and nervous at my first conference and George Sanger made everything okay for me just like you did with DB if you were in that talk before. 
Um, so I hope that at some point I can, I or somebody that I know or one of you can pass that along to somebody else. Here is the motion video with Jupiter Gravity Dunk. Oh my God, wait, is today obsolescence day? Yeah, but didn't Odin give you a job to do? No. Huh. <laughs> A computer playing favorites. Well, one does never cease. I don't think I can fast forward. Are, are you okay? Can you feel your feet and hands? Yeah. Oh, my hip just hurts. Oh, Bert? Bert! Oh! Huh? Oh! Here it is. You enjoy it while you can, Williams! You won't have microgravity on your side forever! Oh! I will dunk on you in any gravity! Jupiter gravity, dunk! <laughs> <laughs> Might as well see this. Well, then I stop thinking we should really like the most of it. <laughs> she called me! <laughs> it's like, um, it's our dirty dancing moment. <laughs> Sorry, that was me. Uh, that was me tapping my rings on my giant jug of water that I usually carry around. It's a weird thing. Um, so that's our talk. Uh, my my talk. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you for coming, and I hope to see you outside. <laughs>